How do you feel about government policies that lead to the establishment of a permanent underclass of unvaccinated people with fewer rights in this country? Carl. Well, look, I, to answer the question, it's concerning what's going to be happening in the next month, two months, uh, the next uh, foreseeable future with, with two classes of people, effectively. We're going to have a percentage of people that are unvaccinated and the majority of people that are vaccinated and their, their consequences and their rights are going to be different than everyone else's. And my concern, and I've, and I've raised this a number of times, is how are my small business owners going to be able to police who can walk into their shops? They can't afford, they've been smashed enough with this COVID and the shutdown and the lockdowns. How are they going to police that? And when I raised it with the Premier, because my, my idea was that there needs to be some government clarity, guidance for, for the 33,000 small businesses in Canterbury Bankstown, uh, her answer was that they should call the police. I, I don't think that's good enough. I think we need more than that. I think they, they need to, some protections to make sure that they're able to deal with that because they don't want their businesses suffering any more than they have when to. When we talk about... about two classes of society, we've heard this throughout, haven't we? Um, particularly with the restrictions and the way that restrictions are enforced. Tell us about how you've seen that from your no. community and what your community has seen when it looks at how other parts of Sydney may be living. Well, we saw the pictures on the weekend of Bondi and Coogee in the eastern suburbs beaches. And, you know, I don't begrudge anyone that lives close to the beach to be able to go there. But when we are stuck at home and we only... We didn't have any hours of recreation, it makes my community angry, frustrated. I mean, we're fatigued after 11, 12 weeks of lockdown now, not being able to go outside. It, it really does hurt. And it shows you a double standard, a double standard in policing. Um, people there weren't weren't wearing masks, weren't social distancing, mm. yet when uh, someone in my community attends a funeral yesterday wearing a mask, social distancing, they get arrested and taken by police. Be be because there were excess numbers? Because there were more than 10 people at the funeral. Now, they were both breaching the health order. One gets arrested when they're grieving and the others get to sunbake. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. Linda, it, it, it is difficult, isn't it, when you apply and there have to be benchmarks to these rules. You have to say, OK, it is X number of people or X number of hours that you can exercise or whatever it may be. Enforcing those things are so difficult and, of course, people feel as if they're being victimised throughout this. In your own area that you represent, are you seeing also this... This two cities? I am absolutely seeing two cities. The area that I represent, uh, four of the local government, three of the local government areas out of four are actually, um, are actually those, those red zones. And what I'm hearing from people, and I've had a lot of interaction with individuals, um, mm -hmm. including uh, Carl over the last week or so, there is an absolute feeling of two cities. Uh, one where you see people going to the beach, the other where you've got helicopters flying over you with loudspeakers, and that's the reality. Uh, the other thing that I'm hearing very much in our area um, is people feel un unappreciated. There's been no recognition of the enormous efforts including from the Islamic community uh, to counteract um, COVID. Um, and I actually think the Premier was absolutely tone deaf at the beginning of this to the multicultural nature of the area. And I just hope, I hope, Stan, that politics doesn't come into it. I really do. Linda and Carl, both of you have had to get um, permits, right, to even come here tonight mm. um, to, to be part of part of this conversation. Uh, travel permits, mm. yeah. Mm. Um, I think they're called mm. movement permits, yeah. aren't they? Yeah. Um, you've got to apply, apply for that's, them. That, that's coming out of the, the lockdown areas, the LGAs are concerned. Yeah. Dave Sharma, you live near the beach. Um, is this what you're seeing, um, the type of things that Carl's talking about? Well, obviously, I've got tremendous sympathy and respect for uh, Carl and Linda and their communities and the resilience they've shown in going through this. And I can't pretend to know uh, what it's been like in those LGAs and the, some of the, the lockdowns they've had to endure. And I'll, I'll be honest, I mean, in, in living conditions that, you know, they don't have access to a beach nearby, it's not within five kilometres of them. Some people are living in high-density houses. A number of them are essential workers who can't work from home. They're dealing with homeschooling as well. It's tough. Look, the lockdown's tough on everyone and I think it's been especially tough on um, on those those 12 LGAs that Carl and Linda mm. represented have felt this more than others. Um, look, 
I hope we're not um, going to see an underclass uh, emerge in society. I don't think we are. I think this is certainly putting a lot of pressure on communities. And understandably, people are angry and resentful and frustrated about what's going on. Um, but I think, you know, we are on the way out of this. Um, there is light at the end of the tunnel, and I hope at the end of this, I'm sure we will. We'll all consider ourselves Sydney siders. Surely, the question, again. Dave, is how do you put it back together yeah. um, at the end of the tunnel? <coughs> and that's the real challenge that's going to lay ahead mm. of people in this city. Mm. We're going to stay with this. Um, our next question, as well, comes from Amar Singh. As a community leader and a charity worker, I'm deeply offended and appalled by the ongoing lockdown at mainly migrant communities in the southwest and western Sydney. My question is, are we hurting our nation's proud multiculturalism and harmony? What will we, the next generations think? How we treated our own as second class citizens? One side of Sydney is thrown to the ground for not wearing a mask and the other side is let loose to enjoy life. We need to show solidarity within New South Wales. This just doesn't pass the pub test. Marion. Mm. Um, I think I think Amar is right, and I think this th there is this postcode privilege, right? And some of I mean a lot of this existed well before COVID, and what we've seen happen during this pandemic is those those uh, it's just being brought into sharp focus. So some of the issues that you brought up. Dave and you know we talked about this the this idea of uh, they are battling there are there is an undergrad I, I think there is a, two two sort of societies being created here and I'm not at all suggesting that this is easy to get right from a policy perspective mm. it's incredibly difficult I acknowledge that and I don't envy those who have to make these decisions however um, this roadmap out has to be an inclusive roadmap it needs to take in, into account there are in, entrenched inequities across multiple multiple communities, including the Indigenous community. And how do we ensure that we bring everyone on the journey um, so that by the end of this, the entrenched inequities that already existed, um, you know, they're just going to be far worse. And how are we going to tackle it at that point? Carl, how do we deal with that when we know that different parts of the city have different rates of, of COVID infection? Um, and we know that in the higher rates, uh, there is a, a, an also a, a proportionate response to that. We saw in the northern beaches of Sydney last year at Christmas, they were locked down during Christmas when the rest of the city could move around. If, as Mariam says, you're going to move to a lockdown, an inclusive lockdown, how do you do that when we already see that parts of regional New South Wales that have come out of lockdown are back into lockdown because there's been another outbreak? Yeah, look, it's, it's been tough, and I, and I admit that the Premier's got a tough job, but the reality is having a tale of two cities isn't one in all in, isn't we're all in this together, which is what she's been preaching. We, we're seeing people uh, in my community stigmatised now by other parts of Sydney, something that they can't get work, they're losing contracts because no-one wants to, to hire a, a plumber or an electrician from my part of Sydney because they might have COVID. I mean, we have co high case numbers because 80% of our workforce in the 12 yes. local government areas are the essential workers that are servicing Greater Sydney. 80% stand. So and they're I, having to move around. They're moving and around and they're, and they're either catching the virus when they're at work or they're coming home and, and spreading it or vice mm. versa. But, but the discrimination where we're mandating a vaccination for, for a tradie that lives in the in the local government area hotspot and and not if they don't and then they're working on the same site they're working next to each other but there's different rules for different people mm -hmm. and that really irks my community it makes us angry that we're being treated this way we had a curfew that the premier by her own admission said doesn't work and then she brings it in for half of sydney or for 2.2 million people it was arbitrary it didn't work we had helicopters flying overhead waking people up I mean, it's just not... It wasn't fair to begin with. And I'm glad that she's lifted that curfew. Otherwise, maybe I wouldn't have been here tonight. Mm. <laughs> we're, glad, we're glad it has been lifted. You can drive home in safety tonight.